Christ is risen. Yes. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Good morning and welcome to our worship service at Trinity on this second Sunday of Easter as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We invite you to prepare your hearts and minds and prepare to worship God.
O oh God, you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. We call ourselves children of light, but sometimes we act otherwise. We love ourselves more than others. We seek to hide our sin from others and from you. We fail to share generously your hospitality. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Shine your light into our dark places. Bring the truth to our lips. In your faithfulness, receive our confession and forgive us. Now hear the good news. God demonstrates God's own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In Christ, God turns to us in mercy. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. ourselves 
and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the epistle to the Colossians, the third chapter, the first through the 17th verses. Listen for the word of the Lord. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And wherever, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. If you were given the task of painting Jesus, how would you paint him? Seriously, how would you paint him? Would you, what colors would you use? Bright pastel colors? I am the light of the world kind of image. Jesus looking forward majestically. Or dark colors, heavy with mystery and shadow. Jesus struggling against forces of sin. Would you give him a beard or short hair? And what about his eye color? What color would you give his skin? Black or brown, tan skin or white? Would you draw him playfully with crayons? A Jesus easily approached by children. Or maybe a cubist Jesus that invites the viewer to interpret what he or she sees, a kind of foregospeled perspective. What would be the setting for your depiction? Would you use a particular story from Jesus' life? 
the healing of the lepers, perhaps, the cleansing of the temple, or the Sermon on the Mount. Or maybe you would depict him with a more timeless perspective, as if he had posed for a portrait. How would you depict Jesus if you had to? It is an interesting question, and I think it could be a powerful exercise for us each to paint or draw Jesus and share what we see. I suppose how we would depict Jesus would tell more than a bit about ourselves. One thing is for sure, artists don't paint Jesus as much as they used to. I suppose this is partially because of the secular turn art has taken over the last few hundred years. That would account for much of the dearth of new Jesus paintings, but I suspect there is more to it than that. Maybe it is because depictions of Jesus are like dynamite. They are loaded with religious and political significance. Often the public rejects new religious art. I'm reminded of stories Fred Craddock told about new art. He told about a chaplain he knew at a Roman Catholic retreat center who was told by his superiors to commission a painting of the Virgin Mary to hang in a prominent place in the center's gathering room. Being an obedient priest, he did just what he was told. He commissioned such a work from an artist and when it was completed, he hung it prominently as he had been directed. His superiors came and saw it, but somehow I don't think the chaplain anticipated their response. Not only did they remove the art from the room, they removed the chaplain from his post. They said he was not competent to hold the position. What the painting de depicted, you see, was a young teenage Mary, probably about 14 years old, as she likely was at the time of Christ's birth, great with child, that is to say, about eight and a half months pregnant. Her stomach was bulging. She looked pretty much like any poor inner city pregnant girl might look, looking a bit scared and out of her league. The church officials said it was irreverent and soon put another painting in its place. The new painting also depicted the Virgin Mary, but this time she was beautiful and Caucasian. She looked to be about 30 years old. Her pregnancy was not strikingly obvious. She looked almost like a movie star. That was the Virgin Mary they wanted, not the other. Then there was another story Craddock tells of an artist with a modest reputation who painted a portrait of Jesus for a local church. By all accounts, it was absolutely shocking. The colors were very dark, purples and blacks and grays. The figure of Jesus had a strange and very homely, ugly, misshapen face. Next to the painting, the artist had placed his justification for the painting, a quotation from Isaiah 53, often understood in Christian tradition as pointing to Christ, quote, He had no beauty or comeliness that any should desire him. He was one from whom people turned their faces, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. The church was scandalized, the painting shuffled around until someone eventually put it into the file 13 and it disappeared, never to be seen again. Although I wasn't here to see it, I heard of a similar story here at Trinity. Many of you are more familiar with it than myself, I am sure. I'm not sure I have the story right, but I've never let me wrong stop me before, so what the heck. Religious art from various artists was hung around our sanctuary and in a prominent place right here now where the organ stands, I believe, if I got the story right. Doesn't get much more prominent than that. As 
people walked in, they were greeted by a very large depiction of Christ on the cross, completely naked. I think I heard that a few people left the church because of it. The issues with which modern religious art struggles were not the same as the issues for older art, such as that of the Renaissance. I'm sure they had their struggles and scandals as well, but as far as Jesus was concerned, there were certain conventions regarding how he was to be depicted. I'm sure you have noticed some of these before, though perhaps you have forgotten. When you spend any time looking at early paintings of Christ, it is not too long before you notice that his face is shining. This shine doesn't seem to depend on the setting. There is Jesus on the cross, his head bowed in death and dried blood on his face, but with a halo behind the crown of thorns. There is the risen Christ, his face and sometimes his whole robe and raiment shining. And in the paintings about his life as he preaches or eats with the disciples or heals or pretty much does anything, there it is, that shining. It looks a little bit funny. Why did all the artists have him shining? Did they think he glowed in the dark? If that were the case, what a wickedly awesome nightlight Jesus would have made. Kind of gives a new spin to the idea that Jesus is the light of the world. But of course that is not really the case. As Craddock suggests, what these artists were really trying to do, no doubt, was to show in art that the only way you can really know of Jesus is through Easter. The only way we can really know Jesus as the Christ is through the resurrection. Easter changes everything. It permanently changes the lens on our glasses. It is holy LASIK surgery, as I rather suggested last week. It gives us an Easter perspective on everything. Through the lens of Easter, we look back upon all of Jesus' life and see on him the glow of the resurrection. We see him through the perspective that agape conquers death, the perspective that God's forgiveness is greater than our sin, that God's commitment to be with us ultimately redeems us. Trying to look at Christ apart from the perspective of Easter makes no sense to Christians. It would be like trying to take the love out of how you view the person most dear to you in the world. It makes no sense. It doesn't compute. Even if you look at pictures of that person from before you knew him or her, you still see those pictures from the perspective of love. You can't help it. The love is a present reality that thankfully cannot be escaped. It warps your vision in wonderfully beautiful ways, in ways that make you see more clearly and not less. If we look back over Christ's whole life, even his infancy, the glow was there because as the artists were testifying, he is risen. Of course, the artists did not literally think that Jesus would shine. But they did think that when you are raised from the dead, you are different. When you are raised from the dead, you do not look quite the same or act quite the same or sound quite the same. If the artists had been writers, if they had been using words, they could have simply said, he has risen from the dead, he has triumphed over death, death he lives forever and is seated at the right hand of God. Where they could have said, as in Philippians, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus 
every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Words can do that. Maybe if the artists had been musicians, they could have written a short light motif, a little short melody to accompany any mention of Jesus. But if you are an artist, if you have only paint and a brush, how are you going to say that? Well, those artists said it by painting a resurrection glow. That was how they painted Jesus then. That was how they depicted an Easter perspective. But what about now? How would we paint those who, as our scripture lesson, lesson from Colossians states, have been raised with Christ? Those who have died and been raised to new life with him. That's us, you know. That's who we are, people of the resurrection. We have been baptized into Christ and raised to new life in him. So how do you think we should be painted? What do you do? How do you talk? What do you sound like to show you've been raised to new life in Jesus? Fred Craddock recalls his baptism as a boy. With a child's sense of wonder, he trusted that something had happened. He felt different, but he wondered how that difference would show. Would his classmates at school be able to tell that he had been baptized? Surely someone who has been raised to new life does not look the same, sound the same, talk the same, act the same. But what's the difference? And how would you paint us so that someone else could tell? The church at Colossa, to which our scripture today was addressed, heard those words about being raised with Christ, and they didn't know what to do with them either. You have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above. But how do you seek the things that are above? According to Craddock, the church at Colossa began by becoming fascinated with what they called mysterious things, something like the ancient counterpart to fortune telling. They began to be involved with something like the psychic readings you see sometimes advertised on the roadside or television. They were interested in seeing the future, maybe even communicating with the dead. If we are going to seek the things that are above and leave behind the things that are on the earth, then we have to be involved with things that are really unusual, they thought. As they became a very unusual church, they became fascinated by things that no one else understood. They blended a heavy dose of Gnosticism, of secret knowledge, into their understanding and practice of the Christian faith. They had a practice that is hard to translate from the Greek. Nobody really knows how to translate it, but they walked in the middle of the air is the way most scholars do it. What they were doing when they walked in the middle of the air, no one seems to know, but they had experiences of elevation. Seek the things that are above, the scripture said, and they replied, hey, we've been raised with Christ. We are not like we used to be, and to prove it, they had some kind of ceremony of elevation that they called walking in the middle of the air. What's worse, they said, we have been raised with Christ, so we must be morally and ethically rigorous and pure. Thus they had a little motto, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch ordinary things and impure things, set yourself apart, don't contaminate yourself by touching the common and impure. It reminds me of the Donatist controversy that split the North African church three centuries later, where certain, certain extreme versions of holiness and purity movements we've seen since. A plus for their religious vigor. These people were really taking it seriously. Wow. 
Sometimes I wish we had a little more of that here, hardcore, devoted people. Just think of what we can do. But Paul, or Paul's follower, wrote to them and said that all that stuff that you're doing, it has a show of religion, and I'm sure you are amazing a lot of people. I'm sure they're fascinated by how deeply, sincerely religious you are, but I want you to know it doesn't amount to anything at all. What you are doing is self-serving, self-promoting, and spiritually egotistical. And it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. You are simply doing your own thing and calling it being really religious. The people at Colossa got it wrong, in other words, and so the question remains, how does it show that we have been raised with Christ? How do we show that we are people of the resurrection? When you go to work or school or go places with your friends, how does it show? Paul said, do you remember when you were baptized? Do you remember the ritual of your baptism? You had some old ragged clothes and then there were some beautiful new ones. When you were baptized, you left the old rags behind. Do you remember what they represented? They represented the things that you were taking off, getting rid of in your life. What are those things? Paul named them. Greed? Take off the greed. Sexual misconduct? Cast it off. Malicious talk against other people? Take it off. Gossip? Throw it away. That was the old. Put on your new clothes, Paul goes on to say. Do you remember what those were? Compassion. Put it on. Being kind to people. Put it on. Humility. Wrap yourself with it. Put on forgiveness. Put on love. Once you have been raised with Christ, you do not wear the old rags anymore. You wear the new clothes of the resurrection, compassion, forgiveness, humility, kindness, and love. I wonder, I ask you, is that true? If someone were to paint your picture this morning as someone who has been raised with Christ, would you literally glow? Of course not. But would there be something different? I hope so. I hope the artists were right about the resurrection. People of the resurrection are not the same. But how would you paint that difference, do you think? Would you give them, would you give us a resurrection glow? It's a question worth thinking about. What's different about you, about us, now that we've been raised with Christ? And how does that difference show? In the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen.
Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning and welcome again to Trinity. Thank you for joining us. If you're new to Trinity, welcome. We invite you to join our email list. You can get on our email list by contacting our church office at 940-382-8815 or by an email to trinity at tpcdenton.org. As we are still in this Easter season, any of you who are able to, and um, desire to contribute to the one great hour of sharing offering, we are still receiving those offerings. We invite others to share from their tithes and their gifts as they are able to the church. Um, we have, after taking a break on during Easter Sunday, our uh, Sunday school class on the Lord's Prayer, uh, our virtual Sunday school class has resumed, as has our virtual coffee fellowship. So you are invited to join us over Zoom um, at 9.30 on Sunday mornings for the Sunday school class and at 10.30 for the virtual coffee fellowship. You're also welcome to join for the virtual Bible study on Thursday afternoon or for the short uh, virtual prayer group on Friday morning. Thank you and welcome.
greed and gossip and slander. And we are called to put on new clothes of kindness and compassion and generosity and humility. So go out, therefore, as though those who in your lives reflect the resurrection glow that we celebrate in our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And may the love of God, our Creator, the grace of God's Son, our Redeemer, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer, be with you now and forevermore. Amen.